But it was during these years that I thought I was living what, was ha what, what I thought was happiness. Partying, doing drugs, drinking, smoking, hanging out with friends, being, you know, having girls and girlfriends and being with women. And this is what I thought was happiness. And I was pursuing these things. But in the midst of these things, I was finding many trials and tribulations. I almost died a couple of times, drinking and driving. One time I crashed into a pole, my friend hit the windshield so hard, when he pulled back, his hairs were stuck in the windshield. SubhanAllah. And as soon as he pulled back and I seen him bleeding and his hair stuck in the windshield, we took another sip of the beer and I tried to drive away before we got stopped by the police. So this is how I was trying to pursue my happiness, but I found that I was only becoming more miserable. Trying to seek happiness within the drugs and within friends and within drinking was only making me more miserable. And my mother, she used to raise foster children. So she had this young man named Edgar, who he was living in our home. He was about 17 years old. His mother had died of HIV. His father was in jail for most of his life. He had a really sad story and I, was, I really felt for him. So me and him became close right away. He told me about an organization in New York called Zulu Nation. And he said this is an organization he, he, he was a part of when he was in New York because he was born in New York. He said you should check him out. You know, you like politics, you like you, I was going to the school for political science at the time. So he said, let's go to New York, let's check it out. So I went to New York with him to check it out and it was an organization, but it was a gang. It was a gang with principles, so-called principles. And at one of these meetings, there was a man by the name of Abdul Aziz. He was a Muslim. He used to be part of that gang. He came and he delivered a talk that day about Islam. African Mambada, who was big in hip hop, he was the leader of this organization. He let him speak. After that, he came to my friend Edgar. He said, listen, take me home. So I said, okay, fine, we'll drive you home. We went to his house and when we entered his house, he invited us up for tea and coffee. He immediately began to talk to us about Allah, about Muhammad, about Islam. And me, because I was always curious, I said, who is Allah? Who is Muhammad? What is this Islam that you're talking about? So he began to tell me, Allah is the one God, the creator of the heavens and earth. He has no son. He has no father. I was like, no son, no father. He has no associates. He said, no, he's the creator of the heavens and earth. Nobody's seen him. I said, okay, I want to know more. So myself, my friend Edgar, and another friend of mine, Tony, the three of us were together. So he gave us a book on Tawheed by Bilal Phillips. It was the first book that we read. This was in 1998. So we went home and we created a little cipher, right? This is what we used to say in the hood. When we used to smoke weed, we would create a cipher, a little circle, and we would build and talk about different things. So we decided to do the same thing. Let's go ahead and sit down. We're going to sit in the cipher. We're going to talk about what this deen is of Islam and who's Allah and who's Muhammad. We're going to read these books together and discuss it. So we began to do that. In the same token, I said, wait, I just can't leave Christianity like that. I was born Christian, so I can't leave Christianity that way. I have to give it a shot. So I went back and I began to read the Bible. I read it from cover to cover. And I had a highlighter in my hand hiding, highlighting anything that I thought was contradictory to what I heard growing up. So and then we began to discuss that. Then we began to study the nation of Islam. We began to study righteous teachings. We began to study a, a, a teaching called from niggers to gods. We studied all of these things, subhanAllah. And then my one friend, Tony, he had also been in prison at one time. He kept telling us the right religion is Islam, the one that Muhammad teaches. And we kept telling him, how you know? He says, I'm telling you, it has to be the one that Muhammad teaches. So we kept on studying. Myself, I, was be I began going to the church or to, and to debates and began to ask questions of the pastors. I began to ask questions of my grandmother who was religious. And my grandmother, she would basically push me away. She really didn't want to deal with religion. She kind of saw me as, look, you're overstepping the bounds, stop asking questions, you're Christian and that's it. So I, when I would go to the church, and in particular, this one moment that is so fresh in my mind was when a pastor was having a debate with a Muslim man, and he said, Jesus is the one and only God. He is the son of God. So I was too shy to ask a question during the Q&A, so afterwards I approached him. I said, listen, you said Jesus is the one and only God. 
But I read in the Bible that Jesus, when he was on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, yes. I said, well, my question is, I have your God, Jesus, the one whom you're telling me to worship, and I have the God whom Jesus is calling upon in your book. So who do I worship? The one you telling me is a God, Jesus, or the one whom Jesus cried upon? He tapped me on my shoulder. He said, son, you just have to believe. I told him that's foolish. How am I going to believe in something you can't prove to me? So it was at that point that I came to the confirmation that, yes, I had to be a Muslim. And me and my three friends, we accepted Islam at the same time. But when we went to Abdul Aziz, because we would go to him frequently during this time to go study with him, learn from him, ask him more questions. So when we went to him and told him, listen, we're ready. I told him, I said, I'm ready, but I don't want you to tell me what I can and what I can't do. I'm a man. I do as I like. I do what I want, when I want, and how I want to do it. I'm going to accept your faith, but don't tell me what to do. He said, fine, no problem. So we took the shahada. But after I took the shahada, unfortunately, I put on my kufi, and I still would go out and drink with friends. And I would run into Christians, and they would say, you know, Christian youth, like myself at the time, and they would say, you Muslim? And I said, yeah. And they would say, why are you drinking? I said, why are you asking me questions? You're worshiping Jesus. <laughs> I know. You're worshiping Jesus, I'm drinking. Stop questioning me. Right? So this was my attitude for a long time. And I went on that way maybe for about three or four months, subhanAllah, drinking, still smoking, still partying. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me one night. I was in the, in my, on my porch sitting with these same friends and one of them, and when I was sitting with them, they were smoking weed and drinking. I was sitting there, it was about two o'clock in the morning. I'm looking out at the, sun, at the stars and I'm thinking, subhanAllah, if I don't change, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to destroy me. And I began to reflect and contemplate further. And I kept coming to the same conclusion, you need to change. If you don't change, how much longer Allah is going to give you? How many more chances is Allah going to give you? You almost died in a few car accidents. You've been having this problem and that problem. Inshallah ta'ala, how much more time do you have? I told my friends, get up and get out. They said, what? I said, get up, get out. They said, you're high, you're tripping, stop bugging. I said, no, I'm not high. I said, this is the first time in my life that I have clarity of sight. I know what I want, and what you have, I don't want it. Get up, get out. It was at that point that I realized, because those struggles that I faced, right, in finding this happiness, in this pursuit of happiness, I was looking for it in the wrong places, drinking, hanging out with the wrong company which is the case with most people. So I knew that I immediately had to change my friends in order for me to reach the state that I wanted to reach with my Lord. And when I changed my friends, things began to change. Life began to become sweeter. I began to see some of the happiness entering. I went back and I found my wife, because my wife, she was my girlfriend prior. My wife now, she was my girlfriend prior to Islam but we had broken up for a while. She was fed up with me, tired of me. She kicked me to the curb. <laughs> so I said, but I always knew that she was a good woman and that she was the woman I wanted to marry. So I went back, knocked on the door, she opened up, <laughs> what you want? <laughs> I said, I need to speak with you. She says, I don't have anything to say. Listen, I'm a changed man. I have a new faith. I have a faith called Islam. Alhamdulillah, she took the time to listen and she became Muslim as well. And then after that, there were other struggles. There were struggles that every new Muslim faces. The struggle of finding a center, finding a place where we can fit in. As a Muslim, new Muslim, that's, I think, one of the hardest struggles that we face. I went to the masjid. It was an Arab masjid because I was going back and forth from Jersey to New York learning from Abdul Aziz. But he knew we couldn't keep going up there because it wasn't a good environment for us. So he told us, stay in Jersey, find the mosque. So when I went into this mosque in Patterson, they were all Arab. I walk in, assalamu alaikum, kayf halik, subhanallah, the imam, inna alhamdulillah, everything in Arabic. I'm sitting there talking about, oh my God. <laughs> These people are crazy. What are they talking about? I don't understand them. So I felt kind of shy to continue going to that same location. We would go every now and then, 
But it wasn't something that I was becoming firm upon because I didn't feel welcomed. I didn't feel like that was a place where I found people who were like me. Until one day we went and I found two brothers who were Guatemalan and then they directed us to a mosque that was an all-American mosque. The khutbah was delivered in English. Most of the people were converts, but there was a mix, a sprinkle mix of a little bit of everything. And then I was able to find a home and make myself firm by staying in the masjid, going to the masjid to learn all the time. Because I knew that if I kept myself in the masjid learning, then the vices would initially go away. But inshallah ta'ala, I only have five minutes. It's hard to wrap up our whole story in this short time. So I just want to discuss some of the other little struggles that I went through. Prayer is another struggle that we go through as new Muslims. And prayer is the source of happiness for us. And sometimes people find that it's difficult when you pray. It's difficult to learn to pray. You never spoke Arabic before. So you're trying to memorize all these words and you don't know what they mean. They have no significance to you in the Arabic language because you can't understand them. But I remember struggling hard. I used to take these little pieces of paper and I would put them on the floor, put them on the desk. And as I'm praying and I would forget, I would take the paper, look at the paper, continue my salat, be in sajda, pick my head up from sajda, look at the paper. And I would, oh, I got to say, subhanahu rabbil ala. Okay, put it back down, subhanahu rabbil ala. Subhanallah. But the struggle made it all the more better. It made it more appreciative. I was able to appreciate it more. Another struggle was during Ramadan. Ramadan, when I became Muslim, I became Muslim in Ramadan, like maybe a month before Ramadan, two months before Ramadan, subhanAllah. So I remember fasting, another struggle as a new Muslim. Fasting was hard. We had to wake up early in the morning. It was like about four o'clock in the morning. Then I'm like, subhanAllah, I wake up at 10, 11, subhanAllah, I gotta wake up at four to eat, and I can't eat till the nighttime. And I remember struggling, coming home those first days hungry. And... I remember coming home one day and looking at the cookie jar. And I'm sitting there salivating over the cookies, subhanAllah, until I couldn't take it no more and I just began eating the cookies, you know. And it was another time that we went at night to pray. And I was in the mosque and I'm praying behind the imam. We're praying Salatul Isha. And he finishes praying and I get up to leave and I hear them get up to make Salat again. And they said something and it was calling actually for Qiyamu for Tarawih. But I don't know because I didn't speak Arabic. So I said, okay, man, they added a salat or something. I'm not sure. I thought we played, prayed the last prayer. So he starts praying. So he makes the turaka'ah. He stops. I go to get up again. And he gets up again. And I'm like, subhanAllah, what's going on? <laughs> and now he's praying for about an hour. And I'm sitting here. My legs are shaking. This is the first time I prayed this long. I never prayed in my life standing. This is the first time I prayed. My legs are shaking. I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm bugging out. I'm sitting here. And, and, and my concern was... I can't leave the prayer because if I leave the prayer, I'm going to be punished. I rem remember I began to cry, right? Because I'm sitting there thinking, man, if I leave the prayer, I'm going to get punished. My legs are hurting. And I, I think the guy next to me probably thought, man, this young man, he's so, he right he's righteous. MashaAllah, look at him, he's crying. <laughs> All he knew is that, subhanAllah, I'm, I was sitting there crying because I'm sitting there making dua. Oh, Allah, stop this imam from reciting already. <laughs> SubhanAllah. And I remember, I think when he stopped one time, I got up and said, and I ran out, subhanAllah. But inshallah ta'ala, I just wanted to make, mention those points inshallah because I think as new Muslims, we struggle through those and even people who are returning back to Islam who stop practicing their faith for whatever reason and are not coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have the same struggles. So I think it was important to share that from the small points in my life inshallah. And I hand the back, mic back over to Sister Nahila. Barakallahu feekum.